the topic for this afternoon, as you can see, is the rape of Belgium, which was the invasion of Belgium by the Germans was one of the causes belli for Britain's involvement in the war. And one of the big motivators initially for uh, the American public to swing from kind of a neutral position to an anti-German, if not pro-British, uh, uh, and certainly pro-French uh, state of mind. Mike has been looking at this issue um, for quite some time now, and I think has uh, come up with a great deal of material to explain all of this and give us some perspective on it. There's a lot of stuff in the museum about this, and he'll show you a number of the posters that we have in the museum that relate to this. It was a prime subject for propaganda for all of the Allied armies and was a, um, a major influence on public opinion throughout the war. And of course, later on, a large part of the war was fought uh, in Flanders in the uh, very west tip of the country of Belgium that you can see here. And many of the famous names like Ypres uh, were actually Belgian cities. So without further ado, Mike, uh, tell us about the rape of Belgium. Well, originally, uh, this presentation was going to be on Herbert Hoover, the great humanitarian, and feeding the people of Belgium. But in the Westport Half Price Bookstore, I found a book called The Rape of Belgium, The Un Unknown Story. And it got me interested in the... Uh, the rape of Belgium by the Germans. And so this presentation this afternoon will focus on Belgium and the destruction German visited, the Germans visited on this small neutral country beginning in August of 1914 and continued through middle of October. And secondly, the role pro propaganda will play in creating a negative narrative that will turn public opinion against Germany and her allies. After the war, a new narrative by revisionists will, re, will rewrite the atrocities that were committed. They'll write them out or they will downplay their importance. Two, comp two competing narratives about the atrocities emerged in 1915. On one hand, you had the British with the Bryce investigation and report. And the Bryce Committee interviewed about 1,200 Belgians, refugees, and recorded their experiences at the, hand, the hands of the German army. And then that same year, the Germans were getting so much bad publicity, they have a rebuttal document called the German White Book, also printed in 1915. It was a, an attempt by the Germans to respond to the charges against them. In reading the two accounts, it's almost as if they were getting their information from competing cable channels. But it's important to keep this in mind. Germany invaded Belgium, a neutral country, and occupied that country for over 50 months. In the process, killing about 6,000 innocent civilians, that's men, women, and children, yes, children, mostly in the first month of August. And then they proceeded to destroy the country's economy, deporting over 100,000 Belgians to work in German factories who were forced to live in substandard conditions and subside on starvation diets. The Germans the German army also destroyed thousands of buildings, homes, and cultural sites, like the destruction of the University of Levin, destroyed. Well, there was a second act during World War II. It was destroyed again and rebuilt. Also, they caused over a million and a half Belgium refugees to flee across the border into the Netherlands. Some stayed there. Others ended up in France, 
in Great Britain. Great Britain, Britain alone had over 200,000 refugees from Belgium who spent the war years there. The Germans in 1915, in order to stop the fleeing, built an electric fence along the border between the Netherlands and Belgium. That fence is going to be 125 miles. The fence will be responsible for the death of an additional 3,000 civilians trying to escape. By the end of the war, the refugees staying in these countries, in these host countries, become like relatives who pop in and announce because they were in the neighborhood and wanted to say hi. And after about four years, you say, go home. Well, the Belgian refugees had overstayed their time in the host countries, and the host countries were becoming resentful of their deaths. By the time the war ended in 1918, poor little Belgium and the atrocities and destruction she suffered will be overshadowed by the cost and destruction that the war had on France and the economic costs done to Great Britain and the Allies. And by the time of the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Belgium's demands were lost in the demands of a louder cacophony of demands by 30 other nations represented. And like the 1965 song by the musical group, The Fortunes, You Got Your Troubles, I Got Mine. And Clemenceau was so badgered by uh, the Belgium representative at the Paris Peace Conference. The Belgium representative said, what more can I do? And Clemenceau said, you can resign or die anyway. So now let's briefly review a little bit of Belgium history. And what you see uh, the uh, Right here is one of our volunteers, Pete Blair and uh, Stan Parsons, climbing uh, the uh, pyramid there at uh, Waterloo. And up at the top of Waterloo is uh, a giant lion. And uh, this represents uh, the victory there against Napoleon in 19 or 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, um, if you look at uh, Belgium, it has a population, or it had a population in 1914, about seven and a half million, and set right between two sworn enemies whose animosity for each other dated back hundreds, even uh, hundreds of years. And those two countries are France and Germany. And like I pointed out, remember the Battle of Waterloo. That was fought in uh, Belgium within miles of the capital in 1815. At that time, in my opinion, and others, France and Napoleon were the bad guys. Germany was not yet a nation, but Prussia and Hanover fought on the side of the British and the Netherlands. Napoleon lost and was sent packing for the last time. Well, in 1830, the southern part of the Netherlands revolt, revolted uh, against uh, the Netherlands and with the support of France declared their independence. And that year, 1830, the great, uh, the great nations of Europe at that time signed a, uh, a recognized Brendan's, our, uh, Belgium's independence. And in 1839, the Netherlands belatedly recognized the independence of uh, Belgium in the London Treaty of 1839, which guaranteed that Belgium would be a neutral country. And that neutrality was guaranteed and signed by Austria, Belgium, France, German, and the German Confederation, Netherlands, Russia, and Great Britain. If you uh, know your Victoria on PBS, Lord Palmerson 
was uh, one of the instru uh, instrumental people in that creation. So when you look at the map of, of uh, Belgium, you've got this area up here in yellow is the country's about 60% Dutch. And then down here, the red part is uh, about 40% French, Walloon, and then you got some uh, small German population over here. So you got three official languages, uh, German, uh, you got uh, the Dutch, French, and German. They're all recognized. And uh, so anyway, and uh, one thing about them, uh, in a lot of respects, they don't like each other. And they, over the years, they squabble, but they come together when they're attacked, like two brothers. So anyway, um, so in, when you, uh, so between 1839 and 1914, Belgium had prospered. Uh, in 1914, Belgium compi it comprised about uh, 2,636 communes. For a small country about the size of Maryland, uh, that's a lot of uh, subdivisions. The communes uh, were the self-governing, they were self-governing, they had control of, over their schools, public works, factories, and even the militia, which is uh, at this time the civilian guard. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Conscription was a curse, and as late as 1909, a recruit could buy a substitute replacement, just like in the American Civil War, Teddy Roosevelt's father uh, got a replacement. As a result of being neutral, Belgium didn't spend a lot on defense. The focus was on the economy, and by 1914, and listen to this, Belgium was the number sixth rank industrial country in the world. She had skilled labor, wages were low. They had a lot of energy, especially coal. They had great rail systems, great roads, and great beer, and the list goes on. So moving along, uh, we got in, this is, uh, this is a new way of doing things for your iPad. Uh, and uh, I'm still getting used. I'm a uh, senior elder citizen and I have trouble with technology. But anyway, that aside, Belgium, uh, moving along, Belgium did have a little shock. It was called the Franco Prussian War. And in this, on this slide, there's four things I want you to see. Here's two old guys sitting on a park bench, it looks like. Well, one of them is Napoleon III and the other is Otto von Bismarck. And uh, France has just gotten, uh, just lost. Uh, they went to war with the Prussians and uh, they got uh, their plow claim. And here's Napoleon III. Uh, he, I think uh, he is nothing like his, uh, uncle. Well, genetically, I don't think uh, Napoleon had any children or any. And uh, Napoleon III was Napoleon the White. Anyway, he surrenders at the Battle of Sedan in 1870. And in this, uh, in these uh, paintings, if you go down here, the, uh, in this painting, this is a proclamation of the German Empire. And this is where the Germans really rubbed the nose at, rubbed the French nose in it. Here they are in the uh, Versailles, in the uh, Hall of Mirrors, and Wilhelm is being declared Emperor of Germany. So you got this. Now, what I like about the Prussians, golly, they can fight, but they also love parades. And here uh, they are and uh, lined up. And they'll, the last thing they'll do is have a parade there in Paris. And not a lot of people showed up, very disrespectful. But 
in the bottom corner here, you have a painting called The Black Stain. And uh, let me bring it up a little bit. Uh, you have this instructor pointing to a map of France. And there's an area on the map that's in black. And he's telling this young lad who is in a military uniform, that is Alsace-Lorraine. And Germany took it from us in the Franco-Prussian War. And the young man and the class, and the young man's in a military out outfit, is going to be your generation that will have to bring, uh, take it away and bring it back. So anyway, you got this animosity. And the French, one thing about the French, uh, they have long memories and they believe uh, that revenge served up cold is okay. Well, anyway, we got uh, moving along um, the, uh, back up here a little bit. So the point in this is in, the, eight, the War of 1870, Belgium breathed a sigh of relief because Germany did not invade their country to get to France. So their neutrality in 1870 was respected. But you know what? They had an uneasy feeling about what might happen in the future. So between the Franco-Prussian War and 1914, they spent huge sums on fortifications around Antwerp, Liège, and Numir. Uh, the two major Belgian political parties, the Liberals and Catholics, and a third growing party, uh, the Socialists, did support defense spending on increasing the army, but fortifications was fine. They feel safe behind these fortifications, it wasn't until 1909 that a conscription law with teeth was agreed to. Now the Catholics, and I agree with them, they worried that barracks life would corrupt young men and they expose them to lascivious behavior, that's my words, and atheistic ideas. So anyway, uh, that was, that, that's what was happening. And at this time, the Belgium army was not that good. Now, one of the, here is one, one idea, and I'm going to mispronounce it, but I'll give you the East Texas pronunciation. Franz Thier, and what it means, translated, it means free shooters. And during the Franco-Prussian War, uh, Napoleon surrendered, Napoleon III surrendered, and he was the last emperor of uh, France. And during that time, then you have a Republican, a Republic, and uh, they fight on. Matter of fact, uh, the Prussians finally uh, siege, put a siege on France, and uh, the, uh, they surrender after about six months, uh, and they were reduced to eating uh, whatever they could, even even rats. And uh, I read one recipe that it, uh, they could fix it to make it taste like chicken almost. But anyway, these free shooters, and you can see in this black and white, there, here's one, here's one, here's one up here, and one behind the tree. And the Germans are coming up the road. This is in the Vosges, in the mountains uh, of France. And so, anyway, think of these, uh, this, uh, the frontiers as um, a people's war. And they, and they would, uh, they would ambush. They would work in bands, fighting at an uh, asymmetrical war. Think about guerrilla warfare against the Germans. And they blow up uh, lines of communication. And um, they'd attack small 
isolated German outpost and kill. They killed over a thousand German soldiers in this guerrilla war. And most of the senior officers and soldiers in 1914, they knew and feared that people's army. And this stuck with them. The big difference is Belgium's going to be different and more compliant than France. France declared war. They were fighting war. Belgium was neutral. They didn't, you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, during the uh, Franco-Prussian War, these frontiers would ambush, and then there would be harsh reprisals against the nearest village or town where they would kill civilians and burn houses and destroy buildings. Whole regiments or divisions often would take part in pacifying actions uh, where these frontier activities were taking place. So these stories are uh, become part of the military experience and is passed on down. And, uh, and we'll see, for example, in the beautiful city of beyond, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So in the Meuse River, 10% of the population was killed intentionally by the German army. This included men, women, and children as young as three weeks old. Collective guilt. We learned this concept early in childhood when something would happen in your family and your parents weren't sure which little toe had to blame and no one fessed up. Everyone was punished. Now, this is what uh, this is the way the Germans did it. The big difference, as I said, between France and 1914 uh, uh, and Belgium, there was no People's Army rising up to kill German soldiers initially. The Burgermeisters think of those folks as uh, mayors who go around collecting fire, the firearms and telling their community not to resist and be compliant. Uh, so, now, let me move here. <clears throat> Now we're turning to the early days of August 1914 and the German invasion of Belgium and France by seven German armies numbering a million and a half troops. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that many troops in an area coming through. If, uh, and you'll see in 1914, the German army consisted of 25 corps. corps. That's about 700,000 men. And in less than 30 days following the start of the war, they had increased that to over 2 million. That's a sea of human humanity. It was organized into 87 infantry divisions, averaging about 18,000 men per division, and 11 cavalry divisions formed into eight armies, seven facing west, one facing east toward Russia. And as we know, uh, they're going to have a two-front war. And if I'm not mistaken, they make the same mistake in World War II. But for this, for our, and one of the things the Schlieffelin plan, which is the German plan to encircle and crush the French, they were in love with Hannibal and uh, the uh, the Battle of Cannae in uh, 215 BC. And here you go. If you look in the upper corner here, right in here, you can see in blue is the Romans. No, they're in red, and in blue, a bow-like uh, line is the uh, Carthaginians led by Hannibal. And Hannibal only has about 50,000 men. The Romans have 86,000 men. And the idea of the envelopment is they would draw the Romans into the bow, and then the cavalry would come in 
and encircle them, and they would crush them and kill them in, in a tight combat. And you can see the Romans had 48,000 killed, and uh, the uh, Carthaginians had only about 7,000. They won the battle, but what the uh, uh, Germans need to remember, Rome won the war. So anyway, but we're going to be, we're going to be concerned with basically three armies, the three armies that are uh, charged with going through Belgium. And uh, here we have uh, Prince Albert. He's the king of, uh, of Belgium, John French, and Lanzarac. He is, uh, he is the commander of uh, the Fifth Army. And then you got these three guys over here, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, so you're going to have about 700, over about 750,000 between all three of these armies coming into Belgium. Now, the generals leading these armies, they believe in the Prussian idea. The Prussian idea, what's that? Bismarck, whose famous quote was, the great question of the day are not decided through speeches and majorities, but by iron and blood. Now, Bismarck left the world stage in 1890 when young Wilhelm decided he didn't need Bismarck and could run the show himself. Wilhelm loved the military, and according to G.J. Myers in A World un un Undone, Wilhelm owned over 300 military uniforms and would change uniforms up to a dozen times a day. One of the jokes making the rounds of Berlin is he wouldn't visit the aquarium without changing into his admiral's uniform. Without the guidance of Bismarck and left to his own devices, he's at the mercy of the military. Respect to the, uh, as, with respect to the Belgians, the German military had no respect for the Belgian army or the Belgian people. And, will, and they will underestimate the will of the Belgian army to resist. As far as the London Treaty of 1839, when informed Britain would enter into the war if Germany invaded Belgium, the German chancellor said, I can't believe Britain would go to war over a scrap of paper. Germany referred to the Belgians as chocolate soldiers. And a Belgian soldier said, one of them said, well, we're only good for parades. And the Germans, they love parades. But anyway, Albert and the government decided if invaded, they would fight to protect their neutrality. There was much debate within the Belgian cabinet, but international law guaranteed that a neutral country could repel invaders and retain its status and rights as a neutral. An issue that proves to be important later, but in the present international, but in the present, international law will not be much comfort. On the other hand, in 1902, in the 1902 manual, the usage of war, the German military leadership declared that international law should be violated if doing so would crush a civilian uprising. Well, the Belgian army against the German army, well, it'd be like David fighting Goliath, but David wouldn't be allowed to use a slingshot. And God, like Woodrow Wilson, would remain neutral, if you remember that Bible story. Anyway, little Belgium decides to fight the German bully with the anticipation that she'll get help from her friends. Now, on this slide, let's just take a look at the three German generals. Uh, at the top, let me get my marker. I'm really uh, getting good with this. Yeah, right there. 
you got uh, Van Klock. He's going to lead First Army. He's 68 years old in 1914. He's seen action in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and was wounded twice. During the march, uh, during his march through Belgium, he ordered his troops to murder hundreds of civilians and burn villages. General Bulow here will lead Second Army. And guess what? Let's see. Uh, Van Bulow uh, also was in the fifth. Uh, he was uh, he was born in 1846. He's also 68, and he served in the Franco-Prussian War. And so, and then Third Army is Carl Van Bulow is considered a war criminal for massacres in the Ardennes on August 20th, and a few days later in Lefe. He ordered the killing of men, women, and children. And I've already mentioned uh, uh, the uh, Liege. But anyway, uh, when asked, how do you think history should remember us? He said, well, we should write history. And then last, you got General Hassan. Golly, I could win the lottery. Each one of them, all three of them are 68. And they were all three in the Franco-Prussian War. And uh, so anyway, upon mobilization, Hassan uh, will lead the Royal Saxon Army. Uh, and it'll become the Third Army. And Hassan was uh, given the command. His army participated in the Battle of uh, the Frontiers and mainly in the Battle of Dion. And we'll talk more about that uh, uh, shortly. And anyway, all three of these generals are tough. They've seen war. They were in the Franco-Prussian War. They saw how the uh, uh, French tiers, the frontiers uh, would fight. And so they were also on a time schedule. And this is one of the things that's going to happen. Their time schedule is going to be like sitting in the airport and they come on saying, your flight will be delayed because there's engine trouble or whatever. They always have an excuse. Anyway, so now, um, take a look at, let's look at the lineup. Now, the matchup in this corner, we have the Belgium, the Belgium Army. And you can see here, the Belgium Army marching. They got dogs pulling uh, their uh, guns. They got top hats that look like they'd make good targets, but not much protection. And so, and there's about 120,000 in the regular army. Now they don't have a lot of discipline because they've been a neutral country. And they're very slack on giving salutes and following instructions. So we have those folks, but then we have Oh, and I didn't mention, they only have 102 machine guns. And I think the Germans have a few more. And then you got the civilian guard. There's 46,000 in the civilian guard. And uh, they're going to make up part of the fighting force. But in October, the Germans threatened to shoot them as uh, guerrilla fighters. Uh, and so anyway, they're disbanded. And the uh, ones that can will join uh, the regular Belgium army. So then you got the leadership. And this is really key. Belgium is fortunate <coughs> uh, that Leopold II, king of Belgium, dies in 1909. He had been on the throne for 42 years. He was corrupt, greedy, amoral, and that was his better qualities. At 65, as an example, he met a 16-year-old French prostitute. He eventually secretly marries her. When he dies, he leaves her to be one of the wealthiest women in Belgium. 
Well, that's enough said about him. He's not the family guy. Now, Albert is the opposite, polar opposite. He's very popular. Well, let's go here. He's very popular with uh, the Belgian people. Matter of fact, uh, they refer to him as the soldier king. Uh, Leopold was so hated, they booed him as his casket uh, proceeded to the crypt. Anyway, from all appearances, Albert uh, appears to be a happily married, to be happily married, and was deeply religious. He'd tell his kids at dinner to feed their body, but also don't forget to feed your soul. And uh, so, anyway, he's going to be uh, the leader of this merry band. Now, let me go clear this and get us up to. Ah, the first major uh, battle is the Germans, uh, they, they have to get through the age. They have to break this fortress because they're on a time scale and uh, they need to open up the Meuse Valley uh, so that they can get all 300, uh, 800,000 men uh, marching. And so here, what you've got is the city of Liège is the third largest city, and it's strategically located on a high bluff overlooking the Meuse River. There's 12 massive triangular forts, and here you can see the 12, and it's like each one of these forts is about two to three miles from the other one. And each one of them are, uh, they're about six miles each into uh, Liège. And so it, it's like a wheel. And in between, uh, they have uh, dug in fortification. So anyway, uh, this is a cutaway of the uh, guns. So you had uh, turrets that would come up and, uh, each fortress uh, had 14 guns and uh, under revolving turrets, so they could move them around. And uh, these forts were made to withstand direct hit from the heaviest artillery of the time uh, that they were constructed. In world opinion, was these forts uh, fortification could stand off. Uh, enemy attack for at least nine months. Well, the problem is they haven't met Big Bertha yet, and so that's coming. Now, uh, here, Van Bulow, Second Army, numbering some 320,000 men, began their attack on the age, and it's 35,000 troop garrison. They think there's only 6,000 there, but the uh, Belgium third division is these has been uh, brought in. And uh, so anyway, uh, the uh, Van Bulow puts Emic, General Emic in charge of the uh, Muse, Army of the Muse. And he's allocated 30,000 troops, and they think uh, they can, that after two days, they can knock it out. Well, it isn't going to happen. Uh, the, uh, while Emic was supposed to open up Liège, the uh, other, the big army, uh, second army, was uh, still coming together. So anyway, they put up a fight. For example, the Germans, let's scare, uh, the Germans will fling themselves in frontal attack on, uh, on the age. And the, uh, in an example, now one example here is, uh, the 
34th division comes in right here and comes in and does a frontal attack. And on the first day, they're going to have 30 officers killed and lose about 1,500 men. And they're not happy campers. So anyway, uh, now Liege, the city of Liege will fall when the 14th, this red line here, on the 7th, all 3rd Division takes off and they're headed back up to Antwerp. And so the commander of the 14th here is killed. And there's a guy that's riding along as an observer, and that's uh, Ludendorff. And so they go across and go up to the citadel and have an easy way to get there. And they're also using human shields, which uh, they tell me is against the, uh, the rules of war. He knocks on the gate and they surrender. So now you got the city is surrendered, but all these forts are still going. And they've lost so many men that um, by August 8th, they have about 3,000 dead and wounded. And so what they're going to do is they send in 30,000 more troops, and uh, this is going to be a siege-type affair. And uh, Ludendorff goes back, takes the train back across, and says, hey, we need some heavy equipment here. And so... Uh, and you can see the Germans, you know, when you're coming across in waves like that, you're going to get get uh, some wounded. So they bring in Big Bertha. This is a 420 millimeter uh, gun. It gets there like it uh, on uh, August 10th. It takes two days to get it uh, put together. And then you've got Stokas or uh, Shokas over here, which are also heavy. They're like uh, 30 millimeter, I think. Yeah, 300. Uh, uh, it's a big gun. And so, anyway, they knock out the forts. And uh, by August 15th, the last fort is. Um, is this is uh op is surrenders and that would be fort launching now it gets hit with a direct hit and you can see here it gets hit with a direct hit and uh a magazine uh powder magazine explodes and you can see compared in size the damage and one of the problems is there is no reinforcement like rebar or reinforcement like they used uh, like Fort Duamont. Uh, it was re it had reinforced concrete. And so the Belgians uh, could have gone to maybe Home Depot when they were pouring the concrete. But anyway, uh, now Now the Muse Valley is open, and what you're going to have now is this. The Germans are mad. They've been put behind schedule. They were supposed to be uh, take two days at Liège. They're, they finally knock out the last fort on August 15th. On August 18th, they start moving. And you can see here uh, that uh, the major uh, massacres, like the first one I want to talk about is Orshot. And it's up here. Let's go right here. It's about 13 minutes from Levin by train. And you can see Brussels here. Now, and then here's Liège, and then uh, I'm going to be talking about probably about two or uh, three of the major uh, massacres, and uh, 
because they happened all over uh, the, um, let's see, okay, by, the, by August the 8th, uh, after the first four days of war, there were 10 or more civilians that had been executed in 21 different incidents for a total of 850 people dead. And that's going to get much greater. And 1,300 buildings are destroyed. And von Molka, he said, our, uh, he, he wrote to his counterpart in Austria, Conrad von Hotzendorf, and said, our advance in Belgium is certainly brutal. Uh, but we are fighting for our lives and all who get in our way must take the consequences. By October the 5th, 14th, the world's reaction to Germany uh, will cause Germany to end the most, for the most part, the mass executions and destruction of property and uh, cultural sites like Levin. The uh, destruction of Levin will be just massive bad PR for the Germans. Even though it has stopped in, uh, by uh, the second month, the British and our allies will continue to use what happened in August against the Central Powers throughout the war. Now, the first uh, massacre I want to talk about is um, at our shot, 156 civilians are executed, including the Burgermeister, his brother, and the 15-year-old son of the Burgermeister. The next day, the entire population was, was ordered to evacuate the city. Mrs. Tillem, uh, uh, Ty, uh, Tyleman related this story. Now, she is the... Uh, the wife of the Burgermeister was executed and she provided a detailed account and she will leave town uh, because they're looking for her and uh, she and about 3,000 women become refugees. Now, uh, what you have here is on August the 19th, uh, you're going to have uh, the Colonel Jonathan, Johannes Stenger, commander of the 8th Infantry Brigade, they enter uh, our shot on the 19th. Now, the Burgermeister, Tiedermann, was friendly and accommodating. I would be too, because you've got a town of about 8,000 and you've got 10,000 Germans milling around, uh, drinking and uh, anyway. Uh, and so he welcomes the German and invites uh, Stinger, uh, Stinger to headquarters at his home. And on this balcony, Colonel, Stinger was shot and killed, and uh, the uh, and there was and the people were blamed for his death, and uh, they accused the son, the 15-year-old son. But later, an autopsy reflected a lateral wound, and the most logical explanation was ricochet hit the plaster with the colonel's death. The troops went on a rampage and blamed the Burgermeister's son. And, you know, the uh, most likely uh, perpetrator was the Germans were drinking. You got 10,000, some of them are shooting off the rifles. There's not, uh, and alcohol has people do. Uh, uh, things that they wouldn't do when they were sober. I guess that's why you shouldn't carry uh, your uh, pistol into a bar. Now, at our shot, 156 civilians are executed, uh, including the Burgermeister and 
And this is the Burgermeister right uh, to the uh, left. And he, he doesn't look to me like a terrorist. And this is a picture of our shot today. And this was our shot at that time. Today, the population is about 28,000. It was only 8,000 then. And uh, I was saw the, uh, and then here, down in the right uh, left-hand corner, this is a, a photo of some of the uh, executed folks. And so anyway, 158 are executed. And one of the stories, one of the things they really went after uh, was priest. Now, a New York, a New World, a New York World uh, reporter uh, stated, in many parts of the world, I have seen terrible and revolting things, but nothing so ghastly, so horrifying as our shot. These are the words of the American war correspondent from, of the New York world, Alexander Powell, who became one of the first foreigners to visit this city after uh, the dramatic events of, uh, 19, of August 1914. Now, there's a lot, there's quite a few priests that are, that are executed, harassed, deported. Uh, and this is Cardinal Mercer, who is the, um, he's the spiritual soul of Belgium. He's, uh, his, uh, and during the war, he, uh, he tries to be, you know, he has trouble with Rome because there are German Catholics who are denying what the German army is doing. And it's uh, like, uh, you know, so anyway, Mercer and a lot of the information we have about these massacres are collected. Priests went around interviewing and collecting and uh, investigating. And uh, so anyway, Father Mercer, and what I want to say about uh, Joseph, uh, about uh, Father Durgent, he was from a little, he was a priest of a little, from a little nearby village called Gerrod, Gerrod, G-E-L-R-O-D-E. And he'd come at a bad time. Uh, all the remaining of the population of Arshad that hadn't been uh, told to uh, evacuate was being held captive in a partially burnt church. And the priest brought a wounded man to the uh, Damien Institute. It was home of the Fathers of the Sacred Heart there at Arshad. Like so many other monasteries and educational institutes, it had been converted to a Red Cross a hospital at the outbreak of the war. The, the Father Superior, whose monks had already been threatened by the Germans, urged Durgent not to leave the monastery. The priest, however, insisted on returning to his parish. But as he left town, he and his driver were seized by the Germans. The cart and horse was confiscated, and the two men, after some delay, were hustled off to the church. En route, the priest was repeatedly struck on the head by the soldiers. But instead of being shoved inside the church, like the driver, they placed him against the wall, an outer wall. Then he was tortured and tormented for over two hours. He was stripped of his Cossack, and here he is standing there in his, uh, you know, uh, just uh, very vulnerable. And the German soldiers committed unspeakable human acts on Father Durgin. Uh, I read them, you can read them. I'm not gonna tell you about them. At various times over the next two, two hours, though in prison civilians who were permitted to go outside the church to relieve themselves, caught glimpses of the priests. They returned horrified. Eventually the Germans got tired of the game and they took him down to the river, shot him through his body in the uh, 
in the water and it floated downstream. He was finally given a church burial and uh, Cardinal Mercer wrote, I made a pilgrimage to his grave, Cardinal, uh, with the, to his grave and amid the little flock, which later, lately have, he has been tending with the zeal of an apostle. There did I pray to him from the heights of heaven. He would guard the, his parish, his diocese, and the country. Uh, we can number, we can neither number our dead nor compute the measure of our ruin. Father Durgin was 44 years old. And that's just one example. And then we come to another one, uh, Tamanines. And this is located on the Sambre River. And it's in a little mining town. It's a little mining town. And it's uh, in the Bornage region. That's the coal fields between Namar and uh, Char Charleroi. And the little church stands on the green overlooking the river. Here it is today, and here it is in World War I. Now, the, uh, there were uh, a lot of, uh, this is the first serious uh, time, this is the first and second army, the first time they met real resistance was in this area around this industrial uh, district of Charleroi and the Mons, and Mons. And this area was still full of civilians, and uh, the fighting would be going back and forth, and uh, the French would come in, and it would be Viva la France, and then the Germans, and uh, and, your, and uh, there's a, just, the Germans finally, uh, root out the French and they uh, go to the uh, south side of the river and they're still shooting at the uh, at the Germans. And uh, so the Germans start uh, executing civilians and they use them as human shields like when they're trying to get across bridges. Now, uh, during the uh, 21st of August, a number of civilians are executed as the French and civilian guard are firing from across the bank. Well, finally, they're dislodged on the 22nd of August from the South Bank. And then there's an execution carried out at dusk on the 22nd. It will be the largest mass murder of civilians committed by Germans until 1939. The execution, 257 were gunned down and bayoneted to death in the place of St. Martin. And right here, right here is the church that they lined them up. And it was at dusk. And you can see the crosses there today. There's 384 grave stones. With all they uh, they died, if you look on there, it's the exact same date for all of them. And it was dust, so the uh, Germans lined them up, and some of the Germans, uh, they think, shot over the heads and uh, didn't want to do it, you know. But uh, uh, after the first volley, uh, the captain or the guy uh, presiding over the execution yelled, stand up. And when they stood up, there was a, <laughs> they, they shot them with a machine gun. And I was thinking, if they told me to stand up, I might really think uh, a while about that. But you had survivors because uh, there were so many, and a lot of them went in and jumped in the, river it was dark and the Germans were on the bridge and uh, so 40 men were drowned in the Sambre many hit by bullets of soldiers posted on the bridge and uh, some are badly wounded some uh, so 32 men women and children were killed by soldiers elsewhere around town and right here I, I don't want to these two priests here this one is Adrian Dock. Now, this young man was 
in town visiting his parents. And this uh, Antonio Hotlet, he was uh, the uh, a priest in the area. Both these men are put in with the ones being executed. Both these guys will be executed. And the last thing they do is do a mass, uh, you know, uh, atonement or whatever the phrase is. Being a Southern Baptist, I'm uh, lost for words. I think uh, last rites, maybe a mass, that might be. But anyway, uh, and then these folks right here, uh, this is the owner of the uh, local cafe. And these are folks that uh, work there and they're killed too. And uh, the woman is, uh, they're burning the house down and she tries to get out and they won't let her out. So she dies. And then uh, the cafe uh, the incident where they brought nine men in and uh, held them there. And then uh, they took them out one by one. And as they stepped across the threshold, uh, they would be shot. And uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that is uh, uh, there. And so that is one of the major uh, massacres. And let's see, let me go here. Okay, the next one, and I got the map here, I wanted to show you, is going to be Duant. Now, Duant is uh, right here on the Muse River. And it's a beautiful city. And uh, in 2012, I visited, I went on the Western Front, the first Western Front tour by the museum. But we never, we didn't get over to this part. Now this is Duant. And you can see what a beautiful city it is. And it's here on the river, the Meuse, and up here is what they call the Citadel. And uh, you can see the, um, this is a photo from the top of the Citadel. And you can see the uh, line of vision. Now one thing I wanna point out, this is the city a month before the Germans came. This is the city after the Battle of Duan. And all these houses were burnt. And you're going to have about 10% of the population who are killed. Because the fighting, this is where the French Fifth Army and the Germans meet and they're fighting back and forth. They're fighting for the bridge to get across and uh, human, humans are being used as shells. And it's, it's really a chaotic scene. And here, I, I, I sent this out to you to show you that the Germans are coming from the east and the Fifth Army ends up over on this side. And then the Fifth Army is going to retire. And on the uh, 22nd and 23rd, I think it is, that's when you're going to have so many people executed. For example, up at uh, Lefe, you're going to have 300 uh civilians executed up here at Lafe and St. Jacques. And this is a working class area. So a lot of these are, are workers, like uh, they uh, over a hundred were hiding inside one of the, uh, the factories and then they came out and the Germans uh, summarily executed them. And you can see uh, the manufacturing uh, of tissue, and I assume they make Charmin or whatever, I'm not sure. Uh, let's go right here. Let me clear this up. Yeah, right here, there's 146 executed. And down here at 
Neff, there's 88 executed. And at Tushapin's Wall, here's Tushapin's Wall. Here's Tushapin's Wall right here. And at Tushapin's Wall, you're going to have 137 executed. And right here, these are some of the terrorists. He's a banker and his two sons, one's 19 and one's about 20. And, uh, you know, they get put in there with the rest of them and, and shot. And uh, so anyway, and then down here at uh, the Bourbon's Wall, You're going to have, let me, there's someone right there in front. Uh, these two, these are three brothers and a sister. This kid here is 15, and his, his uh, home is here, and, Bur and Bourbon, Burdon Wall is where they're going to execute about 77, including the young man and his sister. And the 15 year old, for some reason, he gets passed over and he has to help move the bodies, uh, you know. Uh, and, you know, that's be pretty terrible to see your mom and dad. And uh, so all over, all over the aunt. And the Germans never tried to justify what happened here except to say, they were all, uh, it was collective guilt. They were out to get us. They were working with the French. And so uh, anyway, that's terrible. And here, this is, this is a, I wanted to put this in. This is a uh, black and white. And this shows the Germans. And at night, they were executing these folks. And here is a here is a woman with a little baby, and you see them lined up here. And this is the this is the wall, the same wall where they executed them. After in 1920, people would have you know have their pictures taken, and this is where the uh, Tusha the Tushapin wall was. And here is a monument that was erected and uh it's to it says to the innocents who died who were shot by the Teutons and that's the Germans and Hitler uh, when they came in they destroyed uh this monument I think it is put back up now you say and then for a little flavor, I threw in this right here. And the reason I did is because German painters before the war, a lot of them painted florals, floral shots. Well, this painting here is chaotic. You see the woman being raped, the husband being hung, just chaos. This is by Max Beckmann. He was a... Uh, he, he drove, he, he was in the German army and drove uh, an ambulance. So you can tell after the war, you can, uh, a lot of us, uh, people come back from war and they don't talk about it. Artists and writers, they express that. I mean, you can tell uh, it changed their thinking. Otto Dick, uh, he was a machine gunner, one, two. Uh, Iron Crosses, and his artwork. Uh, you should check that out. But anyway, uh, the aunt. And then we get to the uh, sacking of the event. <laughs> and basically, the, uh, the Germans get to Levin, like on the 19th, and Everything's going good. 
they're uh, going around the shops, you know, they're buying stuff uh, and everything. But what happens is there is uh, the British are here at Mons, and here is the Fifth Army, Lanzarac, and they're getting overwhelmed by the Germans. Uh, the, the unbelievable number. The the uh, British at the Mons, they were probably the best soldiers in all of Europe because they came from the colony. They were professionals. The only problem is they weren't large in number. They could fire a infill 15 times in a minute and hit human targets 300 yards away. They were good. Well, anyway, the up here in Antwerp is King Albert, and they send out they, they want to relieve pressure from the Germans on uh, the French and Brits. So they, they do a shorty out of Antwerp. And here at uh, Malines, uh, they uh, come in contact with uh, the Germans sent out from Levin. And uh, so there's, uh, there's combat. And the, uh, the, the Belgian troops go back. Well, then the Germans go back into Levin. And, oh, and I don't know. I think that one of the things about the Germans, uh, they had a lot of reservists, young men who were pulled out of civilian life and put in to a tough situation. Well, anyway, they came back. When they came back, they lit the place up, and built in uh, the uh, the library was destroyed. I mean, and they destroyed uh, books on all the evening of August twenty fifth. The Germans ravaged the city of Levin. They deliberately burnt the university library. They tried to say they didn't, but they did, and they destroyed over two hundred and thirty thousand books, nine hundred. In 50 manuscripts and 800 print, 800 books printed before 1501. Civilian homes were set on fire and citizens often shot where they stood, with over 2,000 buildings destroyed and 10,000 inhabitants displaced. Large quantities of strategic material, foodstuff, and modern industrial equipment was looted and transferred to Germany. Now, these actions will bring worldwide condemnation. And that brings me to the investigations. And there's three, there's two I want to talk about. Up at the top, Lizzie Van Zeel. And I put her in because the Bryce report, Lord Bryce uh, will head. This, uh, this committee to study what happened uh, in Belgium. And he was respected by the Germans and by uh, the British because this little girl, she died in a British concentration camp in the Boer, during the Boer War. Inside these uh, fenced in areas, over 24,000 women and children died. And this young child died of typhus. So anyway, the Bryce report. Now the Bryce report and Lord Bryce, he was highly respected, not just in Britain, but the U.S., where he had been the British ambassador to the U.S. And uh, he, uh, as I said, he uh, was big and studied on looking at Britain's warts during the uh, Boer War. So the British appointed Lord Bryce to head the committee of barristers to interview. They interviewed about 1,200 refugees and attempted to separate heresy, hearsay from firsthand accounts. None were put under oath and, the, and their names were not given in, in the report. 
for, I guess, for fear that uh, people back home under German control, uh, this could, uh, they would be put in harm's way. Now, so the Price report, the witnesses, and uh, these were uh, these were barristers who uh, interviewed these folks and witnesses who, uh, and this is sort of classism, and it's the witnesses who were of higher social standing were given more trust by the interviewers. In the case of uh, this Madam Peters, the interviewer said most of what she said was hearsay, but she was the wife of a burgermeister and her testimony had some value. And I put parentheses, classism. And then uh, there was another case, in the case of Louis uh, Corquette, and I, that's the Texas pronunciation of a Belgian name. And the interviewers noted that the witness had a composed manner and appeared to be reliable and possessed high intelligence relative to other peasants. Now, to me, that's bias, that bias did play a role. But it was the intent of the committee to produce an honest report, also combine accounts from the diary of dead German soldiers who wrote about these incidences. So initially skeptical, but because of the uh, totality of the evidence, they were eventually convinced. Following the introduction of the report, a narrative of the atrocities by regions, the most common was massacre, massacrings of civilians by shooting or stabbing. The committee noted German authorities never denied the massacres occurred. Destruction and destroying property and burning people alive and the pillage of property using human shields by the Germans throughout Belgium and rape. And I, this, this one gets me. It says, however, the committee was careful to point out that rape was not an official policy of the German army. Well, that's good. Though not the main purpose of the Bryce report, they did offer an explanation for, um, for the uh, atrocities. And uh, I'll get to those in a little bit, but a lot of it was lack of command uh, structure. Uh, you're dealing with huge amounts of men uh, and uh, pull from civilian life. Um, and so anyway, um, following the introduction of the Bryce Report, a narrative of the atrocities by region, and I told you what those were. So the report, <coughs> excuse me, was released in May of 1915. It had an immediate and important impact. Six days earlier, the Germans had sank the Lusitania with 128 Americans killed and over a thousand drowned. In addition, at the Second Battle of Ypres, they used poison gas and conducted a Zeppelin raid on Great Britain. So Germans standing in Britain especially, and America and the American press were very poor. 41,000 copies of the Bryce Report was distributed and every major New York newspaper had published the report translated into 10 languages. The report will be used to advance the war effort and eventually influence the United States into entering World War I. Now the Germans realized that they were losing the propaganda war, so they launched their own campaign to counter the Allies. And the Germans attempted to counter the negative uh, press was hamstring. The British, by the British, uh, the British had an effective Seabock blockade. And secondly, the British cut the cable, the Atlantic cable that the Germans used to communicate with America. So the Germans did have two radio stations, but in 1915, uh, they were seized by the government. Wilson was trying his darndest to keep us neutral. Despite the disadvantages, they did publish the White Book. 
Republic in 1915, the German government asserted that Belgian citizens had launched a savage guerrilla attack against it, the German soldier, and that the Belgians of every grade, age, and sex had participated. This was flimsy and really didn't hold up. When possible, prisoners were giving a hearing and the Germans tried to avoid, they said, killing old men, women, and children. Thank God I am uh, I could get the uh, vaccination early and not be killed. In the aunt, they admitted to killing many Belgians, but here again, they blamed, they blamed them for their own deaths because they had collectively engaged in violence. Uh, they had German soldiers uh, testify, and uh, a lot of it was, uh, I heard, or they said, in Germany also, they did control what was printed. And Germans believed right up to the end of the war uh, that there was a people's war. And uh, in 1918, they also, right up till the end, they thought they were winning the war. And after they lost the war, they had to come up with a new narrative. And that new narrative will be, while the soldiers were in the trenches, they were stabbed in the back by the Jews and industrialists. And that's the new narrative. Now, there was also the, manif the manifesto of 93 German intelligence, intellectuals, uh, including Franz Haber. Remember him? He won a Nobel Prize. A peace Prize, uh, our Nobel Prize for synthetic uh, nitrogen, I think. Also, he was uh, big on uh, poison gas, I think. Claiming, they claimed that Germany didn't want to fight, had only done so out of self-defense. They denied any German misdeed in Bel uh, Belgium. The 93 had den uh, denied the German soldier had deliberately destroyed Levin. They finished their manifesto by stating the Germans were justified in being more concerned with winning the war than preserving art. So one other thing, you got Bernard uh, Dernberg, and he's uh, Germany's man in America. This, his goal was to keep America neutral. Now he's got a tough job because uh, the cables cut, and uh, there's a naval embargo, uh, and also he's got the little issue of Germany invaded neutral Belgium, and the goal was to keep uh, keep America out of war. So there is so so much. Uh, Barbara Tuckman made the comment: "It's uh, research is." Uh, is uh, just really, uh, she, she loved to research. She said the hard thing, she said research was intoxicating because you kept going down different avenues. And this is true. And she said, but writing is hard. And there's so much, and what you're just hearing is uh, uh, on the surface. Now, under propaganda, I do want to say, and this is uh, a historian, Nicole uh, Galus, Galus, she commented that one of the tragedies of the British effort to manufacture two is the way authentic suffering was rendered suspect by fabricated uh, tales. And um, accounts of German atrocities emulated from germ uh, from Belgium they were common this will be the common focus of the British uh, propaganda and I I do want to hit uh, the, some propaganda posters for example the British used visual propaganda to gain support at home the Bryce report had a immediate impact. And for the first 17 months of war, 3 million volunteered. They also, as I say, used posters and cartoonists. Now, we have this one here, the scrap of paper. And what 
what I want to point out here, this, the uh, scrap of paper, uh, Germany broke a treaty. Well, if you're a working man and you're drinking in the pub, you say, and we're going to go to war because of that. I didn't know we had a treaty, blah, blah, blah. So uh, for the uh, elite and the upper class, this scrap of paper had meaning. So to get people on board, you had to have graphic uh, posters. For example, this one, remember Belgium? And you got this young Belgian woman who uh, has uh, the German soldier has his foot on her and blood is dripping down from his bayonet. And in the back, you have buildings burning. That is, and you want to keep what you want to keep your message simple. Remember Belgium. And uh, let's go here. Then here's one. This is uh, from uh, the Philippines, American Philippines. And you have uh, a German soldier nailing uh, this soldier on a, like a cross. Now, and it's uh, what you're saying is by Liberty Bonds. I don't think they ever had any situation like this. Uh, but anyway, that is to get people excited. And here's one, uh, Red Cross or Iron Cross. You try to denigrate the enemy. Wounded and a prisoner, our soldier cries for water. The German sister pours it on the ground before his eyes. There is no woman in Britain who would do that. There is no woman in Britain who will ever forget. So here again, I think the German Red Cross nurses were probably uh, sympathetic. But anyway, there are people sitting around saying, how can we really get people excited and propaganda? This is one of my favorite. Here is a dandy. He's walk, got his walking stick and he's walking along and he's getting man shamed. This Irish female says, will you go or must I? And she's holding the rifle and you can see uh, Belgium burning. And so, uh, you know, are you gonna let your are you gonna look like a a wimp in front of your woman? Get rid of that walking stick. Looks like the uh, quiet man. Uh, but then you have remember Belgium in list today, uh, and so keep the message simple. And uh, let's go here. The next one. I like this one. This is in our museum. And it's hun or home. One of the things you try to do is denigrate your enemy. And you look at this. We know this is a German because of the helmet. But look at the arms. They're elongated. He is ape-like. And so less than human. And this one over here, you have... Uh, destroy this mad brute. And you can see the gorilla is walking onto the shore that says America. And it says enlist. Now, this is something that really gets the American male going, gets him upset. This brute has this woman, and she appears to be uh, bare-breasted there. So you, you bring all these things into it. Uh, now, let's go here. Now, this has nothing to do with Belgium, but it's one that um, that I, I, I saw. This is in our museum. And to me, this is the most powerful uh, poster. And it has one simple message in list. And I, I researched and it said the poster was inspired by a news report from Cork, Ireland, that described a mum, 
recovered bodies a mother with a three-year-old child clasped tightly to her inner arms. Her face wears a half smile, her baby's head rests upon her breast. No one has tried to separate them. The stirring caption reads, and bliss. And this is by Fred Spear. He did this in 19, June 1915 uh, by the uh, Boston Committee of Public Safety after the sinking of the Lusitania. So anyway, uh, check that out again when you're in there and look at the look at this. And that is really powerful. And they look like they're they're dreaming. And uh, so yeah, it's one of my favorite. And uh, let us go here. Oh, now uh, cartoons. Ray Marker is one of my favorite, and you can get uh, a book of his cartoons for about three or three or four dollars on Amazon. And he's uh, he's Dutch, and the Germans hate him. He the this one right here is entitled, uh, the caption reads, he's writing a letter to his mother, and he's saying, Dear Mother, our grave is almost to the coast, talking about the trenches. And this is the Kaiser, and you got these little kids with their throats cut, and he's saying, how I deal with small fry. Well, uh, that is pretty pretty powerful too. And I like this one here. Uh, this is uh, Europa, and she's trying to get to the German. And here's Woodrow Wilson saying, hey, uh, hey, uh, I'm too proud to fight. So uh, that was his 1915 uh, uh, speech. Sometimes you're just too proud to fight. And I like, and here again, uh, uh, the woman, the woman who needs uh, help. You got this German, he's there, and you got the, the poor Belgian woman chained up. And here again, uh, this is the Netherlands. I think they have probably uh, less censorship, but she doesn't. Spare breasted, so very powerful cartoons, and I like this. These two right here. It says it's all right. Uh, let's see. It's all right. If I hadn't done it, someone else would. And he's ramsacking the house, taking what he wants, and the the child is dead. And this one over here is Edith Cavell was the biggest, one of the biggest blunders by the uh, Germans was shooting Edith Cavell, a, a British nurse who was aiding uh, British soldiers and uh, Belgian soldiers to escape. Now here is Edith Cavell being devoured by pigs. And this pig has a iron cross on his uh, tail. And then they got helmets on, and they're eating Edith Cavell. And George Bellows, and uh, he's an American artist in the 1920s. And this is uh, one of his paintings. It shows a German soldier cutting off the hands of a young Belgium who uh, they think it's a frontier or a free shooter. I don't think this was this has actually happened. I think the idea of cutting off hands <coughs> goes back to Leopold II and the Belgian Congo. They did cut off hands of children whose fathers didn't meet their rubber quota. So anyway, this is very powerful. And here, this is one. Germans use human shields. I don't think they ever used, told people, take off all your clothes. But in this painting, it shows the vulnerability of the humans. And they're out there. And the Germans did use shields. And you can see 
uh, Germans here, here, and here. And so this is a this uh, George Bellows artwork. Uh, uh, he he did like four or five uh, paintings because he was affected by what was coming out of Belgium. Now here again, uh, and next month we're going to have a presentation on the Pantheon Pantheon de la Guerre. But it, it's also when you go through there, you'll see here's Cardinal Mercer, Prince Albert, and here is Edith Cavell. Edith Cavell is almost saint-like. She's like uh, levitating above the crowd and she looks like she almost has a glow. So uh, it, was, uh, it, was certain, it was certain propaganda to the Pantheon, but I'm not gonna take anything away from next month. And uh, so, I, oh, this is a picture of the 125 uh, mile long electric fence. And this guy right here was trying to get across. It sort of reminded me of the Berlin Wall, and they would try to go through. Uh, but anyway, I don't know. Uh, I don't think the Germans were paying for the electric bill. And if you want to learn more, these are books I used. And these books were written in the last 10, 15 years. Rehearsal, the German Army in Belgium. That's one of the most graphic, and you can get it on Kindle. And then the rape of Belgium, the untold story, and then German atrocities, 1914, a history of denial. This book was written by Horn and Kramer, and they're both professors at the university or at Trinity University in Dublin, which I hear is a pretty good university. And last but not least, when we travel, I want to go to Dion and stand up here in the Citadel and look down at the city. All right, I think, uh, anyway, Belgium doesn't get much out of the peace uh, conference. It's like watching sausage being made and Dennis uh, Cross did an excellent job. Uh, Belgium wanted faith and guarantees of restoration and compensation didn't get it some faith in being a leading participant in war crimes there were some war crimes but no one was executed john maynard kane was not a fan of uh, belgium clemenceau presided over the conference and referring to belgium he said i feel like a guardian superintendent in an unruly orphanage and then Lord George, I put this in, he disliked Catholic countries, and that may have been plain for one of the reasons uh, uh, he was sort of hard on Belgium. And Belgium wanted to be first in line for reparation. That didn't happen. Herbert Hoover, my next presentation, I'm looking at Herbert Hoover. He's a fascinating person. I didn't vote for him in 1928, but the more I read about him, the more I like him. And, you know, folks, as uh, they say, that's all, folks. Anyway, uh, I hope that you learned a little something and maybe you might want to dig in deeper. All right, Charlie, bring up the lights. Uh, Nancy Kramer uh, died. This is Nancy back in 2012 on the uh, trip to... Uh, the Western Front, and I don't, and I've known her for about 50 years. She uh, made a number of presentations, and uh, so anyway, I just wanted to make sure that we uh, thought of her. Thank you very much. That was a great well done, presentation, Mike. and and gave us a lot to learn about and think about.